Hello, uh, I'm Rupert Norfolk and I'm the course leader of BA Drawing at Camberwell. Uh, and I'm here to introduce a conversation between graduating artists Rebecca Hancock and Adam Barrett with the artist, curator and educator Peter Fillingham. Uh, and also with us is um, Marsha Bradfield, who is the year three leader on Campbell's BA drawing course. And she's going to sit in and uh, we'll see where that goes. Before we start, I want to give you a brief bit of context behind the discussion today. I'm sitting in front of Shamiana, well, a, a picture of Shamiana, the artwork and restaurant by artist Rashid Arayim, because pandemic social distancing uh, precludes meeting there physically. Shamiana remains closed for the time being, but our discussion today is inspired by a wonderful time spent there back in February when the whole third year group of BA Drawing shared a delicious meal hosted by Peter and the Shamiana team, and we spent a memorable evening talking and laughing together. Now this trip to Shamiana marked the beginning of a food and art project that culminated in the BA Drawing Feast, organised and catered by all BA Drawing students together. Fine art students spend much of the final year of their degree developing and making work for a final presentation. Drawing students are encouraged to pursue their own individual interests. Their work might be rooted in the common activity of drawing, but they're free to follow their work wherever it leads them, whether through drawing directly or through painting, sculpture, photography, installation, video, performance, writing, um, text, but their work tends to result in a presentation of objects of one kind or another. So to counterpoint this preoccupation with individual interests and object production, we embarked on a collective inquiry into the communal possibilities of artistic activity with the aim of sharing ideas and experiences. Peter played a critical role in this endeavour by leading workshops both at Shamiana and in the college studios. Together we discussed notions of production and ritual, ecology and anthropology, taste and economics and many other things. Um, during the spring term the students invited visiting artists including Jade Montserrat, Radhika Kimji, Holly Graham and Mohammed Namzi to chat with them together over tea and cake and biscuits and so the term became characterised by talking and eating together as a group. And then in the final week of the spring term, shortly before lockdown was imposed, the whole drawing course, including staff and alumni, gathered to share a feast of assorted dishes prepared by the students. Now, none of us could have really anticipated how poignant that collective celebration would become after the very possibility of getting together in one place was so abruptly denied by the global pandemic three months ago now. Um, and yet this group of, of young artists stuck together and supported each other remotely during lockdown from places as far flung as China, Singapore, Taiwan, Romania, Slovakia, as well as across the UK. And they helped each other to make each other's work. They gave each other feedback and encouragement to reimagine their practices under adverse conditions. Their resilience and perseverance really astounds me. Um, experiencing the work that they managed to produce during this fraught period of social isolation when they were denied access to studios and workshops, I'm struck by their confidence to pursue the ideas um, or their ideas through speculative proposals or provisional materials collaboratively produced or co-authored by circumstance. And I think this is reflected in their presentations on the online showcase and on the drawing showreel. So when I look back on that evening at Shamiana and the Drawing Feast, I feel something that our Brazilian friend Gabriela would call saudade, a kind of longing for the particular kind of shared experience that I think we all miss and perhaps value even more now. So on that bittersweet note, I'll hand over to Becky, Adam and Peter to reflect on Rashid Arayin's extraordinary Shamiana and some of the pressing questions it raises about the future. Um, so to begin, perhaps Peter, could you tell us something about the history of Shamiana? Yes, it's interesting actually, because when, when uh, Rupert and I started talking about um, working together again and, and 
introducing Shamayana to, to the study group and to the course at Camberwell. It was, um, it sort of got me going to think about um, the use of the knowledge I already had about Rashid. And so I started um, looking at um, his book, um, uh, Art Beyond Art, which I started reading when he gave me a copy of it in 2010, when I came back from living in France. And I used it as a teaching aid immediately. Um, and it, it, it seemed to be that there's certain elements within his understanding of the world, his experience of the world, which stimulated him to, to create a lot of thinking about ecology and water and how um, the land itself needs to be respected more and how farmers need to be respected more and how, how we should work with the land more. And as a form of land art, really, because he always represented it from a perspective of being an artist, because um, from his position, he had to use that badge just to be allowed into the room, as it were. So he had to use certain words, certain language, which allowed him to come into this debate, I, the artistic debate for a man from, you know, from a peasant background in Karachi, in fact. So I look, read a lot of those early, those essays in Art Beyond Art, um, and I thought about um, how those essays had been written about in a, in a book which, which I like very much called The Triumph of Icarus. And in the back of this book, there's an essay about the essays in Art Beyond Art. And for some reason, I really warm to this idea. I suppose it's because it's like taking what someone has felt and they've been able to share it with someone reading it and then sharing it on again. It seems to come down to, to what we were doing at Shamayana and what, what you've done through the education process of challenging how should we be doing this. So I like the idea that there's been a sharing scenario and I learn things through other people's words. I can often feel them and see them, but when I, when I can read what someone has said about something or when I can hear what someone has said, say about Cezanne and Mont Saint Victoire, sometimes that's how I can actually take it in. So I need like multiple languages to, to understand something. So it was very helpful for me to start looking at how Shamiana may have come about, because I work with Rashid as an artist and collaborator, and I assist him on lots of things, and I never speak for him, because that would be not in any way, shape or form interesting to me. What I like to do is study some of the things that he's allowed me to try and study. And that's what's been so good about Shamiana in general. It's allowed other people to take something and to run with it and to take it into their own form. I think that with the art parties we had, that happened to a degree, but people were still very shy. But what you did, um, the staff and the students, to get collectively as a community, you, um, you took it to a place, I think, pre-lockdown, where we are in fact at post-lockdown. By that, I mean the way you used it as a, as a space and the photographs are testament to this. And then to hear what Rupert just said on behalf of him and Marsha and the other team, the way that you all took care of one another through lockdown. If any of, if any of that um, relaxedness came from the fact that the course brought you to Shamayana, encouraged you to come to Fort Cozy, and then asked you to create your own form of feast. If those things happened um, before lockdown, and if those things encouraged you and enabled you and motivated you to carry on a certain attitude um, through lockdown, I think that really has been a massive teaching and a massive sharing for all of us, putting us all on that same page. Um, I think, you know, why, to use that horrible word, why is it? that we needed lockdown to actually make it clear to us that the physical spaces of the universities don't actually allow people to create those communities. You know, the, the actual, the way that we think of white spaces or tools or anything, we're still carrying on a certain language which 
doesn't enable people to create certain communities. I think it's different in all places. But that one thing that it made me think of seeing those photographs, and I have to say, um, in terms of a piece of conceptual art, um, it, it is created through the participation of other people. So collectively, we, we have seen Shamayana actually function, which I think is absolutely uh, fantastic. The other thing it's made me think about is the way that you created and took Shamayana and you continued it and you took another space, which is the canteen at Camberwell, which I, I love being in there when I came to visit and I studied there and hadn't been back for many, many years. But you took that space and you gave it um, vitality and you gave it meaning and you created a community. And those photographs are testament to that. Thank you. <laughs> um, I quite liked how um, you were talking about like the sense of community from Shamiana because I think when I have reflected on the experience, um, Shamiana and the drawing feast did encourage us to support one another during lockdown and I think it built that community that I personally didn't experience and um until Shamiana um so yeah that is definitely down to the experience that you provide us um but I just wanted to ask a question about how Shamiana is so Shamiana is an example of how the subject of food and art has been a conceptual proposition within the work of Rashid. Um, so as I believe you and Rashid work closely together, um, as you hinted that you collaborate and assist with him, um, and have also recently exhibited together at the Chelsea space. Um, so I was curious on when and why did the subject of food and art become an interest to you particularly, Peter? And what is your relationship to the project? In, in the, um, it's, fun, it's, a, it's a great question, actually. Um, <laughs> when I was, I'll, say, I'll say, try and say it fast, there's just images flash into my head. One where I'd be um, observing or watching my nan um, making chapatis or grinding mint. And um, my nan was from India grinding yeah. mint and grinding uh, ginger together. And I'd often spend a lot of time just watching. I wasn't ter terribly outgoing, to be honest. Um, I'd spend a lot of time watching my dad, who was a, a bandsman in the Royal Marine, cleaning his white solotopi or pith helmet or doing his boots shiny and observing a lot of sort of quite sensuous things. As a child, I, I didn't want to go out at all. I, was, I just wanted to stay in. And be at home. It's kind of strange. And years later, I started going to Tuscany. To um, I first went with Tasta Dean. She was making a film. She wanted some help with Maria Mertz. And in Tuscany, this fantastic um, situation called Arte all'arte would create um, exhibitions and and sensory sort of artistic actions and curations within the landscape and within different buildings. But each time the artists would go, they'd be working within the making process of that particular part of Tuscany. So if this particular area was very, um, had a lot of mines to do with um, um, alabaster or something like this, or if a lot of honey was made in that part, the people behind Art al Arte knew what was already possible in Tuscany. They knew what the history was possible they knew the politics, they knew who was making what. And so food and art and the history was all working together and the artists and the curators would step into that in environment. They wouldn't be bringing in something from outside. They'd step into the environment that was there that the people from the gallery and Arte and Arte sensed and understood so much. They weren't trained art artists or curators or art historians, they just experienced growing up in Tuscany mm -hmm. and whenever I curated shows myself well it began with a show in Folkestone the greatest show on earth um, I would include the use of our local produce and living in Thanet and coming from Kent 
I've always become very excited by the local produce and local craftsmanship that was around people that would make things. Um, and I think that personally, my my engagement with that has, has was quite highlighted with um, my own interest in cooking and food and I developed my own sausages. And Rashid and I would often talk about the sausages I was developing and he would always enjoy those conversations because he's always cooked food at the third text office or at Artists for Democracy. He'd be cooking biryanis for everyone. And it was very much his way of um, taking part also because he was very much someone who would observe and learn. So um, we had a lot in common to do with, with our interest in, in food. And obviously we'd be discussing color and different things. And through making the sculptures, I would learn about the different kinds of wood, the different thicknesses, the different ways of preparing the raw ingredients. And of course, that flows through the conversations that we have there, which can be conversations with his guests about mathematics, about geometry, politics. When we eat at the studio, um, everyone sits and eats, everyone. And as he said, there's no subjects that we talk about in the studio that everyone isn't, isn't part of, because it is all interlinked in that way. And um, so the role of people from the outside is very, very important, whether it's gallerists or students or all sorts of people, people reviewing the work or filming. So it's, a, it's very important that we can eat together and have something we can all share together. It sounds very simple, but it, in real terms, it really does do the trick as we, as we know. So my relationship to food and curation, and also going beyond the sort of normal art thing is very important to me. And, um, and Rashid wanted to do this thing. And um, so collectively, we all started looking at, at the feasible na nature of this. He started it and kept it as a piece of conceptual art. So we weren't looking at some of the business plans that a restaurateur would look at. It's not a restaurant, and yet it is. And once again, to use the language that we, in our kind of artistic community, we use that language, it doesn't really translate to, um, if you say to a chef, it's not a restaurant, but she or he is still working as a chef. Yeah. They may not get what we're saying as such. And, and we can't actually expect everyone to get that or to understand it. So the thing we're learning at art college may not be the language that we actually need to learn to be able to talk to other people from other backgrounds. You know, the minute we leave college and stuff. So it's drawing language, obviously, is one of those moments where you can choose a variety of languages to communicate with someone. And uh, the question I have for you is, so in my opinion, the experience that I had at Shamayana was an experience. I think what you were saying is quite right about like the literature, writing it down doesn't really encompass what, what it was that we were feeling during this time and the way we could only do it was to reenact that through the drawing feast and the way we can discuss what happened at Shama Shamayana was re-experiencing that original rich experience of all sitting down together and having a meal and talking about art and living and breathing that um, experience. So how would you describe the work at Shamayana? To me, I look at the project as an installation, as this well-designed curated space that is encompassing and I was wondering what language would you personally use uh, to describe a project like this as this is such a new and exciting development in art history combining food and human interaction with food and then human interaction with other humans uh, how would you describe that in your own words? What and actually add to what you've been <laughs> add to how you've said it. You mean? <laughs> Don't quite know if it's possible. Uh, it's it's interesting because I I I've, I've actually been um I've been um um seeing the images of everything with such fresh eyes, and I've been I've been I think the way you put it is 
is something that I'd like to sort of jump on your bandwagon, actually, and hear the way that you say it and Becky says it and your your co-workers and colleagues and your your peers and the people in your artistic community. Um, because I'm selfish like that. And I just I just love the idea of of hearing things that I might feel being said by others in ways that I don't have the words or language to say it. I think that um, so for me, it was very much the structural part of setting the space up and trying to create the bits and pieces, the, the, the nuts and bolts. And, and, and under Rashid's direction and try and be the bits of glue between different conversations and things. But then to actually see it working, um, it's only honestly by looking at these photographs that you kindly sent through, I was able to look at what we'd actually done together and what we'd been able to start. And funnily enough, when we had to close because of COVID-19, it made me realize just what an achievement we'd all been part of physically, conceptually, um, with you bringing your time and energy into it and the curriculum being able to be strong enough to, to, to bring a question to us like that. But not just a question, to bring people, thoughts and activities and to envelop us and do things with us. I think that um, it's made me realize that we've got to stage one and we've seen how it can function. And now I get the sense that um, we can move into the more poetic part now, be much more bold, be much more brave with language and with words and with activities. I absolutely loved the photographs at the feast where people were making things and where activities had been created. Started drawing in Shamiana, they're kind of exquisite yeah. warps and, and not just drawing, but collaborative drawing. And, the, yeah. and the, then in the, in the feast that was happening on a tablecloth as well, the, the idea that it produced drawing activity. Um, no, yeah, definitely. I've kind of got something I want to add to it as well, is that when we did do the drawing feast, like I noticed that like primarily it was the combination of food and people to like, to be together and to discuss art, but also how we conceptualize the planning of the night. So like the exact same as how Shamiana is created by these designed objects, um, but how like, so for example, with the menu, we created five different poems about um, which fit each of the five senses of what you would experience in that night. Um, and I thought that was something that was really, I mean, it was obviously poetic, but also it was kind of like inviting you into the space to hit all of the five senses. And I thought that was really lovely. Um, and also we made tablecloths um, as well, which was something that was really nice because I think with, with Demi Styles' work, um, we used her color palette and her designing and re like um, recontextualized it into a into an eating environment. Um, and that was something that she hadn't done before, but collaborating with her um, for to make that piece, it, all, it has also changed her practice in color palette and um, kind of exploring more from her paintings, um, which I thought was really nice. So it has hit us all in like um, in different ways as well, which I thought was interesting. I've been doing Zoom meetings with some students from Canterbury, parallel to working with 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 you, and um, the activities that that you talked about that you started and well you're already doing, but by being on the course itself, the activities that you um, as a team and the community used were really influential on the way that I was able to support um, the group of students from all different age groups at Canterbury. And, and we, we copied and tried to do some activities like think of, um, conceive of exhibitions. Who would be in those exhibitions? Would they be writers, architects, you name it. 
And that was really interesting. And as you say, Becky, it, by when people work with other people, their own practice um, doesn't get ignored. It gets almost felt yeah. as opposed to, I mean, we're, we're always asking people to know what they, you know, know what you're talking about or be able to say what you mean. But actually, when you stop worrying about it and you just start peeling potatoes with someone else, suddenly the practice that you have inside you comes out perhaps in a different way, a different form. And as you say about your, your friend's work, doing those tablecloths was quite a, it was like a beautiful painting and I can see in the photographs. But of course, it was something which took people to actually be painters, to sit there. They're actually sitting together in time and space, sharing time, sharing space. And painting is such a huge language in that respect. And I think, and I, I kind of, I know that the students I work with on Zoom at Canterbury really did appreciate the idea of these activities. Um, and so that, that really much came out of observing how you were doing that. So to see the photographs of the feast were really quite lovely. I can't wait to show those to Rashid, actually. And I really want to hear the things that you've said and this film. I really want, you know, colleagues at the Tate and people who are thinking about Shamana to hear what you say and what your, what your teachers say. Because I think what we have here is a voice which is incredibly positive about what makes people tick and the senses being fantastic for people to be talking about the senses i know that you know myself and rupert and marsha when we we're at art school or studying i i probably think staff possibly didn't really talk about the senses that much so it just proves that things can be done it takes a bit of courage and a bit of faith collectively and and now looking back and that's why your reflections on this and uh, are so important, and the reflections of your staff as well. And, and having Marsha's fresh eyes looking at it is so important because it's a fresh eyes now looking at us is what's going to place us. Even beyond that, Peter, I, I was struck by how this meal is a bit like the loaves and the fishes. So it somehow or another ends up. Yeah. Uh, feeding well beyond the moment of us all being in that space together. So the kind of the nourishment of it uh, has a, outstrips the spatio-temporality of that meal, which is really exciting. Interesting. Um, so I've got another question, um, more based around um, yours and Rashi's practices. Um, so Rashid has created these minimalist sculptures to form the table bases um, in Shamiana and bright geometric paintings and relief on the walls. Um, so I'm quite interested in how do your practices um, relate to one another in maybe your recent exhibition in the Chelsea space or, um, or just how you guys collaborate together as artists um, and what's the formal relationship between between these? With the Chelsea space, um, what was really interesting was because Donald Smith being um, the way he is, he offered us the Chelsea space itself as a, as a, as a structure. So we, we described it to Rashid, what it was like as a space. And he, he trusted us and listened to us and about what the space was like. And um, and so the, there was a kind of collaboration between the three parties in that way. Um, and after that, um, I made a piece of work for that show out of blocks of wood um, called Twinkle. And I sat down with Rashid afterwards and he gave me a tutorial with, with a piece of paper and made a drawing. And um, what was amazing was I looked at the drawing and I knew what he said, what he, what he meant. But I couldn't quite visualise it until during this lockdown thing. And it was all about a diagonal line or something that's diagonal. And I started realising that, that there was something in that that he picked up on, that he enjoyed the, uh, the diagonal line that he uses in his work. And he said, why don't you consider this? And um, it's up recently I've started realising that, that, that there is a lot in this kind of a military sort of 
salute or a military kind of diagonal or cutting things in half or something physical that it seems to be in me. And I've been um, suspending pieces of wood diagonally in the space. So rather than have like a kind of structure that Rashid uses, very strong structures, which also very delicate, I don't have a structure to dangle these diagonals in. And it's kind of allowed me to learn something from his work that I get a very strong sense of something very um, non-physical in his work that you can almost pass through. It's not frightening the way a Tony Cragg can be frightening or Richard Serra can be frightening. My own thoughts about my work, I think my work is less physical in many ways, um, but he also represents a lot to me about the way that I have taught and the way that I have been taught and the way that I sometimes don't have the courage to do certain things. And then, um, I, so I think there's, a, I'm, I'm very interested in how do you get the courage to do things as well. And maybe that's, that's why within teaching, I always know that it takes great courage to make anything. Because when I come to my own studio, you're incredibly, you're not the power junkie that you are when you give a lecture. You're on your own in there. And it's a really funny shift. I think this allows the course to be on its own with the students in a way, because you're all going through, we're all going through something equally. And I think Rashid is, shares that with us. When we work with him, he shares the making of the work. The collaboration is is the space itself and the fact that everybody wants to be there and wants to be committed to try to do something collectively. So I think a course is a bit like running a magazine, I suppose. It's a collective effort. And if someone doesn't want to be there because they have to do something else, let them. And then they come back ever refreshed. And so I think my relationship with him is is a bit like that, really. I'm not quite sure totally what it is but I've been asked to curate a, an exhibition with him in a in a gallery in Paris and um, it's made me feel so intense about being courage courageous so to do it once is good to do it twice is good to do it three times possibly you start getting a bit more full of yourself or a bit more courageous I don't know so it's a bit like that, really. It's allowed me to repeat doing things. Also, when you make those things, you're repeating the same thing day in, day out, hour in, hour out. You know, it's incredible. But what it makes you realize is if there is a key structure, you can do anything. If there's holes in the net, the fish get out. And so it's made me realize that if we can have something that we can all have, that we can believe in. Uh, it was so I, I was going to say in my practice, um, I use flat image and object hoods and obviously Rashid uses a lot of geometric design and mathematical design, as you've been saying, uh, in his construction of the space. And I remember being there and seeing all these as behind me is um, all these bright, vivid colours and being. Uh, delivered this bright vivid food that had all these sharp different contrasting tastes and obviously it's such an overwhelming experience especially being uh, with friends which sort of uh, sweetens the whole thing. We were wondering other than ours have you had any other feedback from customers about I shouldn't say customers um, about uh, the experience that they've had during Shamayana? Actually, it's interesting because my direct relationship with the customers wasn't the same as the the team who actually um, who are you know chefs waiting um, management. But but I worked very closely with them and observed lots of things with them. As did um, uh, the artist Magella Dowdekin, who works in the studio with me and with Rashid and, and Mushtaq. But um, at the parties. And when people came, I would say that people kind of knew that this could be something. They knew that they something could happen. And it, it it's odd because um, I think a lot of very 
interesting people came along and and yet the something hadn't yet happened to allow us to fully recognize or to fully blossom or to or to fully do something um but i think now that we've talked about these activities and different things that we've been, been doing collectively with your group maybe we could feed that information back out there and a lot of people came and 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 um enjoyed the food absolutely and they they really like the um they really like the vegetarian stuff a lot and um a, a freshness of approach that that karen who i've known for like 20 odd years actually and her son joey sammy sorry i've known them for a long time the way that they cook they're very much into a vegan kind of situation but rashid's into many many more things than that and, and so it, a lot of a lot of the participants and customers came and they enjoyed the food for what it was very much um mainly the food not the sort of alcohol or the drinks that we offered so much until we did like special cocktails and things they enjoyed those as well and maybe it's because there's a, a celebrative part to that um and people i think who didn't know the art side of it uh seem to like the um the sort of the, the the food itself as you did and um but i think i think that um because you're susceptible to all of it you could get the the whole picture uh, and and i think it's that 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 um the event side of it because they were coming in to have a dinner to have a, have a meal they liked it but when you came to an event then when you went home the event continued so you weren't coming there to buy something, to buy a meal. I think that might be something that the, the visitors came to buy something and take something home, whereas you came um, um, for many other reasons. I think there's a kind of funny, interesting thing there somehow. Don't quite know what it is, but it just made me think about it. <laughs> Can I come in on that? Um, because... Uh, th that idea sort of of being present in a particular capacity chimes with my question. Um, earlier you said, Peter, you used the metaphor of a hole in the net and you were talking about us all having something in common. And of course, if you have a hole in the net, then the fish swim away. And I think that what you were really advocating for was equality, a kind of... But of course, it, um, if you are a fish and you find a hole in the net, that's a very good thing. Um, <laughs> we can also think of it as being quite authoritarian. Yeah. So I guess I was thinking about sort of these structures that organize the space and mm. how when they come up against the informality that is enabled by the preparation of food and then of course consuming together. Mm -hmm. I'm just so intrigued to reflect on and to ask you about how we spend so much time talking about structures and form in art school, but how can we teach for appreciating and paying attention to informality? I think it's fantastic what you said because um, as as you were saying it, I suddenly thought about you know the 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 genre, the practice that we have of um, of accepting certain sets of things. Like when we write we write curriculum and study plans, and there's almost like genres to that as well. And and there's a structure to it, and and then the informality of then expecting or wanting something to happen on top of it. Is um, is such an interesting, such an interesting thing. I mean, I I um. I for me personally, I think I really love the idea of of something being understood by everybody. Um, so every single person gets that bit of it, and then they can sort of add their own bit on top of that. I suppose what you're saying, and 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 yet when when I when you were describing it. I could smell the histories. I could see the scholarship of and understanding the genres of an artist like Rashid to to create a structure that can then be put in the space. And then, how does that in, then how do you get the informality to take place? And I think that's the question that that the students here have been addressing. 
um, the course, the structure, very clearly and carefully defined what it was going to present and the students were able to take that on. Some of the conversations we had at Forcose were really fun. You know, it was about people's background. It wasn't about art. It was about so many things, which then stayed with the student body and then maybe came out another way and another way. So it made you realize that they were bringing, they were creating an informality. But can that informality be at the start of the process, part of the structure? Um, it's funny because when, when, I, when I sit down and I make molds, I make the same mold the same way every single time. And when I make those long wooden structures or small ones like this, I set it up with a drawing and I make it the same way at the same time. Like when you mix plaster, you just use it at a different point. And that language of creating that structure, I think, might be a place that we could begin with, with, you know, as a teaching block or a thinking block and see where that, what, how you, how do you, but then how do you then bring that informality to that? It's a fantastic thing. And I think it's something that I particularly love, actually, that, that question or, or how do you do it? Um, I think, I think the college allowed their canteen to be in for an informal space and it looked like it worked but when I saw those images of the exhibition you guys did too there was an intense formality which was also very informal very human very felt wasn't there in those pieces of work so I guess we have to keep doing all the different things you, know, you still have to be able to present the text still have to be able to make a show so you have to be able to do those formal things and to understand something and go back and question something to create that informality. And what is that informality? What all of this has made me realize that is if Shamayana was at the Tate Modern and you did with it or did to it what you did at, with your canteen at Camberwell, it would be a, a master stroke, I think, of how do you create an informal situation where people feel like they can truly get involved. And I think at art schools, we're already doing it. We just haven't understood or patted ourselves on the back and realized, oh my God, that bit really did work. That field trip, everyone was happy. Well, why do we only have one a year? <laughs> it's making us think about why do we try so hard to kind of squeeze everything out when it's all, everything's already there to begin with. Um, so we are really excited about this project. It has a very rich history, which has found itself in this very complicated time. Um, with the government lockdown and restrictions in place, where do you think this relationship of food and art that Shamiana was demonstrating will evolve into? In Any form of you know, institution, not being a bad word, but being a group of people or however you would want to describe that, you know, a concept can ask itself, um, what does tomorrow entail? A and that's a lovely place for everybody to be, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that we hopefully, fingers crossed, you know, as practicing artists and thinkers within say just London to begin with, I, I think there'll be some very important vibes coming from the, the Tate um, to think about how they might carry on tomorrow and the next day. Um, I think that's it's a very exciting moment for us to go to people who run these places and talk to them and share this kind of information with them as well and not be strangers, you know, give them that benefit of the doubt because they've also been in lockdown. They've also had carers. They also have parents, poetry and collectively the same worries, you know. So maybe this gives us an opportunity to think about, you know, that everyone could ask themselves this, this very question. So, you know, when you're taught sculpture, you're, you're taught to come up with questions, not answers. So that's a great question for all of us to think about. And thanks for that, because that's what we're trying to think about. So I'll hopefully be able to get back to you on that. And I'll send you the form that we, that we send for the funding, because that yeah. might be really 
quite exciting and interesting. And you'll see what a major part of that you've all played as well. When when um, Adam started giving an account of of his his um, experience, I, I think it would be really nice to to yeah to to have some of those accounts from from you and some of your colleagues and your teaching staff. And in the different disparate languages that you get, it's it's really very very exciting actually to hear those those un unclipped languages, the different languages that can come from how do we express ourselves when we when we taste something, when we sit down together. I think yeah. there's there's a that would it's I wouldn't know how to ask that of you as an activity, yeah. but it yeah. would be great to get something written or just to use that form or said or even just images of what that could be because mm -hmm. I think that that would be the best feedback that Rashid could ever hope for really just yeah. just to sort of prove that he, he was as usual he was right there's got to be something here there's got to be something that we can put back in which uh -huh. was always the dream also well, London was a great place in the 70s wasn't it in the 80s things happened which we haven't yet shared with people like yourselves and we need to share those things mm -hmm. we need it's a question of history isn't it and sharing the history of what was actually going on in this fantastic city hasn't been taught along with many other elements of our histories that haven't been taught so there's a lot there's a lot of work to be done i think <laughs> yeah as you were confused on how to ask the question and how to call it a reflection or anything else. I'm trying to think generally on how food um, has brought um, me closer with people that I'm surrounded with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when my house um, have a big dinner together, the first five minutes is all of us review, reviewing how good the food is we've just made. <laughs> and that is always what happens on the first five minutes. And it's exactly what we were doing in Shamiana, um, as two of the people I live with were there next to me. Um, and we seem to always do that when we're eating. And then it goes into this really um exaggerated conversation about how great creating things are and um <laughs> and just like how much we enjoy that um and then all just being together and um and putting all of our ideas together so i feel like rashid is 100 percent right <laughs> it does bring people together and it does bring like creators as well I think it's really important I think it's really interesting like put, bringing artists together in like a food environment and how that can expand um all right well thank you Peter so much for uh conversing with us today about Shamayana and the Drawing Feast it was such an incredible experience and it's going to be amazing that Becky and I can look back on this in 5 10 20 years and realized we were such a major part of Shamayana's journey and experience in London, as well as our experience in uni. Yeah, just to add on that, thank you very much for joining us. And we are really excited to hear more about where the project is going to go in the future. Well, thank you. And all, all of your, um, your, your community of artists as well. But but what's great is that is that you can recognise that that um, and you can be sure that you've made a real contribution to to how we can start developing this. So um, I sincerely hope you'll carry on sort of taking this forward and thinking about how we can keep developing this concept of Shamayana and where it can lead lead all of us collectively and. Um, and if I might say thank you at this point, um, it's been truly fascinating to be reminded of how important it is to have artists. And I have this very strong feeling working with, with Rupert and, and his colleagues and all of you, um, that that was the case. And it made me really feel this is so important that, that we have artists and the role of artists is, is getting more and more and more 
fascinating and I'd say probably much more powerful as well. And so from Rashid and, and, and everyone who works at Shamiana, it's been really exciting for us to, to have had you come to visit us. And from Charlotte and Janine at Forcozy as well, you know, we all recognised immediately that Rupert was part of a course which was actually taking something very special into the world. And they were really quite thrilled with that, to be very honest. Um, so Rupert, it's been really great that you bought elements of the course. But of course, it's having those eyes of Marsha who can see this. It proves it happened. It proves it's happening. And it proves it can have an effect. And that's got to be the thing that we should all be most proud of, is that it, it, it can actually, you know, become. It can grow. It can develop. Well, thank you really very much to all of you. Um, thanks, Adam and Becky, for setting this up, for organising, you know, thinking of these questions um, and for re really giving some fantastic insights from your perspective of this experience, which, which is really what it was all about. Um, and for me, that's been an education and something that I can reflect on and build upon with, without question. And I'd love to stay in touch with you and... and, and we can, we can work on things in the future with the course because I think this doesn't have to be the end of anything. I really need to thank Peter. Thank you so much for your contribution this, this term and for, you know, we, the, you mentioned Forcozzi and, you know, Shamiana and we had to duck and dive around all sorts of questions, <laughs> all sorts of issues, um, geographic and logistical to make this happen. Um, but it all brought together art and life in a particularly vital way, which I think is what made it refreshing and, and urgent. Um, I, and I also, I think we have to thank the Shamiana team for Karen and, and, and everybody for their hospitality because they really pulled out all the stops with that dinner it was fabulous. And they catered lunches for the other year groups with their workshops. They really made us feel at home and relaxed. I've never felt like that in a restaurant ever. Um, so that was wonderful. And I think really the, the last thanks has to go to um, Rashid because you know his, his vision has staged this and I think all of these conversations and conversation is such an important word and, and this we've talked so much about sensuality and I, I think there's something really so sort of synesthetic going on here where the experience is characterized by all of these different perceptions coexisting and triangulating um, to catalyze the conversation and for me, that's that's how the whole thing has, has come together. And yeah, I've learned a huge amount. So thank you all very much for, for your contribution to this project. And big thank you to Rashid. Yeah, bravo. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Let's keep the conversation going. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, see you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.